Welcome to another edition of Ask Isaiah, your host Isaiah Rhodes. And we are about an hour away from game two of the Rockets and Warriors series. Many uh, basketball enthusiasts have anticipated this series for the entire series. Both teams have been on a head-on collision for each other. And I think the first game was the epitome of what we're going to see. A highly contested individual game, but I think the series will definitely go in Golden State's favor. I'm of the opinion that it'll be a competitive sweep. Maybe a gentleman sweep. Houston might be able to get one. But I felt like just the way that Golden State has played over the last couple of years only lends itself to these moments. They're great uh, in terms of ball movement and just just competitive, uh, raising, raising their competitive angst as the season goes on. They really rise to the challenge against the best teams over the years. And I feel like for Houston, a lot of their uh, moves that have been made over this past, these past two years have been built to face this team. But fundamentally, they really play into what Golden State wants them to do. They have two of the best isolation players in the league in Chris Paul and, and James Harden. And with the barrage of three-pointers that they take due to Mike Antoni's system, they can overwhelm teams except for Golden State. Golden State has the, the best shooters of all time. And because of the way that they play, whether it be off, off ball screens or just being able to create off of uh, Kevin Durant when things break down, they are versatile in many ways. I feel like defensively, we always speak about Draymond Green and how he's been able to really anchor one of the best defensive teams in the league. For Houston, what they have done with Clint Capella in terms of the rim running and pick and roll out of oops and things of that nature, that doesn't work against a team like Golden State because Draymond can diagnose everything. And he's been able to switch on every – he's been able to switch on everything and because you have to switch in this league because this, this is really positionless basketball, Golden State is at the peak of positionless basketball. And when you have a player like James Harden, who's dribbled the ball 550 times in one game. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but there has to be some deviation from it a little bit. And I think when you have a team that has done something so well for so long and built these habits and has gotten this far, 65 wins in a Western Conference Finals appearance, it's very difficult to break those habits. Now, if you look at the, the team stats from the game, it's, it was relatively even, evenly contested. You know, um, Houston had 13 turnovers to Golden State's nine. Uh, Houston actually out rebounded uh, Golden State by one. But one of the one of the big issues and in, in determining factors of how this series is going to turn out: Kevin Durant, 14 to 27 from the floor, three or six from three, just uber efficient, 37 points, and he went toe to toe with James Harden, who had another 40 point game in this postseason. Another game, 140. Um, Chris Paul provided 23 points. Eric Gordon had uh, had 18, but I think just in, in how P.J. Tucker struggled, uh, Gerald Green struggled, Lou Balmonte struggled, those things are gonna are gonna pale in comparison to what uh, Clay Thompson does with 28 points and the the way that he got his 28 points. A lot of his points came off of turnovers, back breaking three pointers, and you had to deal with. A, uh, a a struggling but timely Steph Curry with a lot of his baskets. He shot, he ended up shooting eight for fifteen. But I feel like when he made his baskets, it really uh it really took away from what Houston was doing. Just this this series overall, it's it's really the epitome of what many many believed what happened once Kevin Durant went to the Warriors. As great as certain teams are. There's just no there's there's no answer to the levels that they can go to at their peak performance. Um, based on how they're they're based on how they're going to potentially be in the finals, their potential matchup will be the Boston Celtics based on the first two games that we've seen. Uh, a 30 point victory in game one. Many believe it, it wasn't really indicative of what this series would be. But Boston is clearly the better team. They have more depth. And I feel like the coaching caveat that they have with Brad Stevens completely obliterates what, what the completely obliterates what 
Cleveland has in their trump card, which is LeBron James. Now, LeBron in the first game was really canvassing what the what the matchups would be, how they would defend him defensively. And you saw that, especially in game two. He came out completely dominant, scoring 25 points in the first half, missing a bunch of free throws. But here's the issue. As great as he is, this team, especially with the role players that they have, aren't ready to flip the switch. You have a LeBron, as dominant as he is, really needs to be reliant on on a second star to, to carry weight as well. Now, if you look at the stats, Kevin Love had 22 points, 15 rebounds. Those are the numbers that you need. But they came in inconsistent stretches. And when you're dealing with a team like Boston, who just won't go away, they're not intimidated by LeBron, especially with the initial barrage that he was providing in the first half. You have a Jalen Brown who, who combated that 25 points in the first half with 20. Those things put Boston in position to to make their run and steal the game. Now, when you have a player like LeBron who has a triple-double, 42 points, 12 rebounds, 10 assists, your team is supposed to score over 100 points. Boston held them to 94. That level of defense in the face of a 42-point performance only demoralizes a team like Cleveland, especially when you have players that haven't played at this stage. Jordan Clarkson, Ronnie Hood, uh, Larry Nance, these players haven't seen this level of performance, this level of intensity. And as LeBron raises his level, you, have, you need players that will have to raise it as well. Now, one thing that Cleveland can hang his hat on is that when they get home, I doubt that George Hill and, and J.R. Smith will combine for three points and only shoot one for 11. But here's the thing. Boston, their game is more the, the way they execute it, the way they execute the way, the way they play their game, that's more reliable than, let's say, uh, Larry Nance or, or or George Hill having a breakout game to really swing the series. See, when Indiana played, they weren't intimidated by, by Cleveland, and they had a chance to win that series on multiple occasions. They just let the game go because of their inexperience. But they weren't afraid. They played to win. Toronto didn't play to win. They went into the game in their head. They went into the series – with being in their head and they weren't able to play to win. They were playing not to lose. When you do that against LeBron, you're going to lose. Boston understands that they're the most superior team. They understand that they have the records of weapons to to battle a LeBron at this stage in his career. He's still the best player in the league, and he still puts forth that level of, 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 that level of performance when need be. But when you don't have the weapons around you to, to battle – a team of this magnitude, you're going to lose. Now, people are going to say this is a team beating Cleveland without Gordon Hayward or without Kyrie. But I'm of the opinion that this team, as it's constructed, doesn't necessarily need Kyrie or Gordon Hayward at this point. You have two uh, lottery picks in Jalen Brown and uh, Jason Tatum, both coming into their own at the right time. You have an exceptional coach in Brad Stevens. Then you have Terry Rozier. Terry Rozier is not a player that needs that. He's not a second-round player who snuck by. He's a first-round draft pick. That being said, you also have uh, Morris, who who came into the Celtics program with something to prove. He has been she has been struggling in Phoenix and in Detroit for some time. Goes to Boston and has a purpose. Brad Stevens put him in position to utilize his skill set, and he's just a dog. I mean, when you a dog in a good way. I mean, an alpha dog meaning. He, he really wants to uh, to really go after it. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but I mean that in the sense that this team really wants this. And when you have a have a mountain like LeBron that most teams in the East really are aiming to climb for, that the idea of facing LeBron year in and year out really gets the teams. Danny Ainge came into to multiple seasons, not just this one, but previous years with the plan to dethrone LeBron. They're a year ahead of schedule, maybe two years ahead of schedule, honestly. But when you have the the coaching and the general managers and unison and the players that are hungry to prove that, then you these are the results you're getting. Uh, game four, game three and four will be this weekend. So we'll see how 
Cleveland is able to respond. I, I think their role players will play much better at home. But I'm of the opinion that this would be a gentleman's sweep. And I, I'm giving them one game because of how LeBron has been able to rise to the occasion on many occasions. And I, I feel like to, to completely count him out would just be a disservice to everything that he's done. As I mentioned on previous uh, vlogs before, I think he's won championship in the next two years away from being the greatest player of all time. And I don't think this loss would deter me from that opinion, but I just feel like when he doesn't have the, the requisite weapons to truly compete at this level, there's but so much he can do. Getting him to the Eastern Conference Finals and having him competitive going forward, that's that deserves uh, respect in, in and of itself. But this team, this Boston team, will not be denied. And I feel like Brad Stevens, to to not get a coach of the year vote from his peers is a, is, is a complete disgrace. And I feel like being one of the young coaches coming up in this league in contention for one of the – being respected as one of the best coaches in this league, to truly have his uh, his magnum opus at this point in the season is – it's just – it's it's amazing. I, I think um, Danny Ainge deserves a bunch of credit. Going forward, they're going to have to make some decisions about who they're going to let go. Will it be Jalen Brown? How long can they uh, can they keep Haywood before they have to make a decision about moving him? And honestly, uh, Terry Rozier is making, um, is, is making Kyrie Irving expendable. I don't want to put that out there and – because Kyrie Irving's in this problem as well, but I think his injury, his injury status over the years has put him in an, expend, in a, at an expendable um, position. So we'll see how that turns out. But in terms of how these series have gone so far, we're two games in the Eastern Conference Finals, we're one game in, in the Western Conference Finals, about, uh, what is that, 40 minutes away from game two. So we'll see how that turns out. Also, we had the draft lottery. Yesterday, you had Phoenix, you have Atlanta, and you have the uh, you have Phoenix, Atlanta, and Sacramento for the top three. Phoenix is number one, Sacramento is number two, Atlanta is number three. Now there's a, a lot of decision making in terms of who's going to be coming out number one. I'm of the opinion that DeAndre Ayton should be number one, and then you also have Mike, Michael Bagley coming out of Duke as well. I think the bigs in the, in in this particular draft are of great depth. You have Michael Porter Jr. as well, who's coming off an injury, but he was projected to be number one, and he had, he uh, ended up coming back in the SEC championship tournament. So we'll see how his draft stock is affected by his, his injuries of the past. But I feel like this draft, you have Mikael Bridges, as I mentioned, Bagley, you have A, and I think this draft will, will, will round out pretty well. I think the number one pick should go to A, and and Aiden and Devin Booker combine to really build Phoenix up going forward. Devin Booker deserves to be on the winning situation. But I think, especially right now, considering the inconsistencies at the coaching position and just really the flux that they've had post Steve Nash, post D'Antoni, and just the inconsistencies with what direction they want to go in, I think Devin Booker deserves to have another option next to him. Maybe he's not a number one option to, to, to lead a team. Maybe Aiden could be that anchor, and then Booker could be the perimeter scorer necessary because he can score with the best of them. But I think Phoenix needs that going forward. We'll see how that turns out. Um, for for me, as a Sixer fan, having the, uh, the number nine pick could bowl well in our favor. Right now, we don't necessarily need it. You have the likes of uh, Embiid, and Ben Simmons going forward, and potentially LeBron James or Paul George and free agency. So you don't need it, but any any requisite draft picks going forward could help. You need more shooting. You need more playmaking in terms of in terms of being able to create shots. So if you can find that anywhere and utilize that for this upcoming process that we have going forward, hey, that'll all work in a favor. So we'll see how that turns out. But as I said, tune in. To the Western Conference Finals tonight, game two, we'll have much more going forward. This is Ask Isaiah, Isaiah Rose. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe, leave a comment, whatever you like. Any any uh, discussions you want to build on, let me know. Ask Isaiah, Isaiah Rose, over and out.